Right. Hi, everyone. This is Karen Whitaker with the League of American Bicyclists. Thanks for joining us for this webinar um, on taking your bike on Amtrak. And while I'm with the League of American Bicyclists, we're doing this webinar as part of what will become a series of webinars for the Amtrak Bike Task Force. The task force was started almost 10 years ago uh, when a group of advocates, just individual advocates, state, local organizations, national organizations, got together with Amtrak to talk about how they could Im improve uh, bike access on Amtrak. And you'll hear as we get into this presentation, some of the real progress that's been made. Uh, for that first decade, Adventure Cycling was the lead advocacy organization. They co-led it with Amtrak. They are, are uh, passing the baton to the League of American Bicyclists. So we're looking forward to becoming more involved. And as part of that, one of the goals for the League is really to get you more involved. So we're looking forward to, to doing some webinars, to hearing from you about what you're interested in and how maybe we can all work together on this. And that's why I said this webinar is one of a series. Um, so we decided to start with an update on how to travel with your bike on Amtrak, just sort of to level set on, on where we are now the, in the improvements that have been made. Um, and so I'm gonna get to that in a second, but before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to mention that we will have a Q&A session at the end. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we've got a big group, so I'll be moderating and asking them from the chat. If for some reason we don't get to all your questions, don't worry, because at the end of this presentation, we're also going to introduce a new survey that's out where we can, where you can give us your, your feedback, whether it's on a specific trip you took or just general feedback. And that will go to both the task force and to Amtrak. Okay, so... For today, we have two speakers from Amtrak. They're both on the government relations team. We'll hear from Derek James, who's the Midwest director out in Chicago, um, who's also a bike advocate and has served on the board of the Active Transportation Alliance out in Chicago, as well as Mariah Morales, who's the director of external affairs. She's here in DC, and I know that she also bike commutes. So these are, um, we're just really lucky to have both Derek and Mariah as part of the task force and as uh, bicyclists on the inside. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mariah and Derek. Great, thank you so much, Karen. I was so curious if I could unmute myself, so that worked out great. Sorry, I had the wrong link. I think I was the one that was delaying us getting started today, so. Uh, well, thank you. On behalf of myself and Derek, we're really excited to get a chance to meet with everyone and talk about what the summer and fall schedule looks like and um, maybe flag some of the changes we've made on our website uh, that I hope will be more informative. And then you'll see one of my last slides is um, here's stuff we're trying to do right now. Uh, Derek and I are passionate about trying to improve mobility uh, for folks, including bike riders on our service. Um, um, but you know, this is a, a piece of what we do. So we're, we're doing our best to spruce up some uh, resources that we know are outdated online as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but it's really been helpful to work with, um, you know, all of the members of the task force to try and help us focus on the things that are the most important to you right away, and then keep addressing, um, how we can make service better down the road as there is um, the opportunity to do so. So um, I think, uh, Derek, do you, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words to get us started. And I, I think what we thought we'd do today is, um, seems like there are a lot of, almost 100 people on the call so far. Um, we thought it would be helpful to just sort of level set and remind people about how uh, varied the bike service is around the country. Um, and a lot of that reflects what's available in equipment. So we thought we'd show you what some of the equipment looks like that might be outside of your region. And, uh, and then we would talk a little bit about what we're doing this summer and fall to bring bikes to different services in different cities around the country and what, what you should be able to expect. And then uh, again, we thought we'd hit some of the resources that are available online. So 
Um, that, that's sort of the overview of what we thought we'd, we'd bring uh, to the conversation. And Derek, I think if you would like to sort of kick it off with a walk through some of our equipment and what service folks might uh, be able to see this summer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and try ahead and advance this to the next slide. Of course. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, as Mariah indicated, uh, we uh, over the last 10 years or so have been working with the advocacy community uh, and internally to be able to find solutions to accommodate uh, bicyclists uh, and their needs for travel on board our very varied fleet uh, that's been acquired over many decades, uh, well before there was the uh, sort of progressive notion that folks should be able to bring their bicycles with them on the train. Uh, so we have several different styles of equipment that uh, really define uh, how we can accommodate uh, folks who'd like to bring their bikes on the train. Uh, so the first thing uh, I'd like to go through is, you know, many of our overnight uh, long distance trains, which uh, connect our major cities with rural areas across the country, uh, have what are called full baggage cars. Uh, there's an image of one there on the left. Uh, you can see uh, one of the challenges with the baggage cars is that uh, they are at about 48 inches. The level, the floor of the car is at about 48 inches above the bottom of the rail. Uh, so uh, that requires uh, some dexterity uh, and the ability of the cyclist to be able to lift their bike up into the car from the boarding platform where the guy with the camera is up to the conductor. Uh, and then the conductor would store the bicycle in the train, as you can see on the image, the inset there to the right. Uh, these baggage cars are new to us, uh, new relatively speaking. We've acquired them over the past 10 years, uh, and they did come equipped with bicycle racks uh, that are um, that are sort of uh, dovetailed into the luggage uh, racks there. You can see some baggage there for regular customers. Uh, so because of that service, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, the the uh, we call that train side check baggage, and that is available primarily at major stations where the train is stopped for a period of time, where the local uh, ticket agent is actually bringing baggage out to the train. And so that's where the conductor is out by the, uh, in the car, uh, helping to load the baggage. And it's at, at that point that you, the cyclist would bring your bike out uh, to have your bike loaded on the train. So that's not at every station, uh, but that's at major stations where check baggage is handled. Next slide, please. Maybe that's me controlling it. Okay, I guess it is. So, <laughs> I think uh, we might have control. <laughs> I guess so. All right, excellent. It's a little delayed there. Thanks for your patience. So uh, the next uh, type of service uh, is uh, also uh, carry-on, a style of carry-on bicycle service. Uh, you'll see that on trains like our Capital Limited uh, between Washington, D.C. and Chicago, which parallels the very popular Gap Trail. Uh, those cars... Uh, were purchased by Amtrak uh, mostly in the 1970s, uh, and there is one one of the coaches on these trains has a baggage section on the first floor. Uh, the benefit of that is that since the train is so tall, uh, it also the train is uh, sort of lower to the level of the rail. Uh, so you can see there are several folks standing, and it only takes just one step to kind of uh, get into the car itself. Uh, the conductor. Uh, if there's a reserve, if there's a reservation for a bicycle coming into a station, we'll know that uh, one of the conductors should go to that car, uh, open the plug door so the bicyclist can walk their bicycle in and hang it on some racks that we have retrofitted into these cars. Uh, these cars did not come with bike racks in them, but we worked with the cycling community and with our mechanical folks to come up with a solution uh, so that folks can actually walk their bicycles uh, into that car uh, and then hang them on the rack. And all right. Uh, a, a really uh, success story for us is in the state of California. The state of California is an aggressive partner uh, in providing passenger rail service uh, to corridors uh, connecting major cities throughout the state. Uh, they have uh, not only uh, purchased pur purpose built cars, but also done some retrofits uh, where their uh, bicycle, their ability to carry bicycles is almost unlimited. Uh, you can see there on the left. Uh, there is there is an image of a uh, one of the California style cars. It is a bi-level car, so it's easy to step from the platform right into the car. And then you can see inside there there are lots of bike racks. 
Uh, the state of California uh, charges a very low rate for that. Uh, uh, in some cases, you do need to make a reservation because it, it looks like unlimited space, but uh, it's um, very, you know, we need to know how many folks are going to show up. Uh, the uh, last uh, uh, style of car that we'll show you is uh, called the AM fleet. Uh, those are single level cars that are primarily used uh, in the Northeast uh, and then some places in the Midwest. Uh, those cars were built in the 1970s primarily, again, without any bicycle carrying capacity in them. We've worked with our mechanical department to remove one of the luggage towers where folks would stack their luggage. Uh, and actually there's a racking system there uh, that has a, a support bar coming down from the wall, uh, but the space itself uh, is not tall enough. You do have to remove one of your wheels. So you have to be a little, uh, you have to be able to manage uh, the mechanical piece, the mechanical part of actually removing your bike. Uh, that car, uh, and it varies on how many of those cars are in the train. It depends on how busy the train is. Each coach will only accommodate one bicycle. So let's say for instance, we have a four car train, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to, there to carry possibly four bicycles. Uh, the last uh, example I'd like to show, uh, these are the newest cars in our fleet. Uh, the states in the American Midwest uh, were successful at securing a federal grant to actually purchase a new fleet of coaches. Uh, these cars are being rolled out of the factory right now. They're being manufactured in California. There are 88 of these cars that are being deployed on routes that use Chicago as the hub. So off to major cities in the Midwest, like St. Louis, Springfield, Detroit, Kalamazoo. Uh, each of these coaches uh, has a luggage tower uh, that can be used for luggage, but it also can be used for bicycles. The luggage uh, shelf is lifted up and secured in place, and each coach has a hanging uh, tool to hang three bicycles. So those are being deployed around the Midwest. Uh, that again is a style of carry on service where you make a reservation with Amtrak when you purchase your ticket uh, for that bike space because usually uh, there's a limit of how many bikes can be carried somewhere between three to six. So uh, here uh, we've got again the variability in the types of service or the types of rolling stock or coaches and baggage cars that we have leads to a variability in the type of service that you'll see on different trains across the Midwest. Uh, I know we've got 100 folks on the call, I'm assuming, or maybe I shouldn't assume that a lot of folks know what the Amtrak service is near their community. Uh, and so here I've tried to sort of list out and you might wanna take a picture. I hope we're gonna provide this presentation to folks afterwards, uh, but the several types of service, I've broken it down based on the types of trains um, uh, that uh, the types of rail cars that we have, our corridor style services, which is the predominance of the trains that we run, uh, tend to have those Amfleet style cars uh, with just one rack per coach. Uh, so you can see examples here, uh, the Northeast Regional, which is our spine line from Boston uh, down to DC and to Norfolk. Uh, those uh, you'll, you'll probably be able to carry somewhere between one and four bicycles uh, is the maximum capacity on those trains. There are a couple of branches off of the Northeast Corridor, the Keystone service over to Harrisburg, the Valley Flyer up into the Connecticut Valley, up to Springfield and Greencastle, uh, and then the uh, Down Easter services uh, up into Portland, Maine, all use that sort of Amfleet style service, uh, as well as the Vermonter uh, up into uh, Burlington, Vermont, and up to the border at St. Albans. Uh, all of these services that you'll need to reserve a space ahead of time and pay normally a $20 fee. In some cases, the states have negotiated and they want us to charge us a lower fee. And I've indicated that lower fee uh, after the service. Uh, any place where there isn't a dollar figure, uh, it's gonna be the $20. Uh, sort of moving down the list there, uh, you, go, you go to the Chicago about two thirds of the way down. Uh, Chicago uh, uses the venture cars and sometimes the old Amfleet cars. Uh, those trains generally will accommodate, again, depending on the length of the train, somewhere between three and six bicycles per train. So, uh, and the charge will vary between five and $10 based on the train or the distance. Uh, now moving on to the West Coast, uh, where we have a sort of a rich level of service. Uh, we've got the Cascades route between Seattle and Eugene. Uh, those trains can accommodate between four and six bikes. Uh, then San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, uh, the Pacific Surfliners can carry, I think, around 10. 
uh, and then the Bay Area services out to Sacramento and down through the San Joaquin Valley use those California cars that I showed you where there are lots of bike racks in them uh, and uh, the charges are therefore lower. Uh, next, we go to those full length baggage cars that I showed you first. Those are primarily used on the long distance transcontinental overnight trains. Those are the cars, remember, where you have to reserve a space with us. Uh, it's $20. Uh, we primarily will allow you to board, uh, take your bike out to the baggage car and give it to the conductor at the major cities where baggage service is being handled. So uh, on, say, for instance, uh, two thirds of the way down, uh, you've got the uh, Chicago to Los Angeles train, the Southwest Chief. It has baggage service at the big cities, Kansas City, uh, Albuquerque, Flagstaff, and Los Angeles. Uh, the smaller stops in between, the train is only stopping for a minute or so. Uh, so no time there to uh, uh, load bicycles. Again, uh, there are some cases though, where there is a significant amount of demand and we are certainly welcome to hear from the cycling community on this, uh, where even though there may not be baggage service handled by a local ticket agent or the train may not stop as long, there's enough demand there for uh, cyclists to be able to board the train that we do have some of those stations with no agent where you can like the stops along the Gap Trail, like Cumberland and Martins, uh, Cumberland and Harpers Ferry uh, and Connellsville. Uh, Lafayette, Indiana, the home of Purdue University doesn't have a ticket agent, but uh, we allow you to put your bike on there, uh, as well as Winter Park, Colorado, where the Winter Park Ski Resort is. There's lots of mountain biking opportunity and demand there. Uh, so, and those are the full-size baggage cars. We also have some transcontinental trains that are lower in uh, ridership, so we don't have a full baggage car on them, but we do have the coach baggage cars. Those are the bi-level baggage cars, the bi-level cars with coach seating up top and a baggage section down below. Uh, so it's lower to the platform uh, where we will, you'll ride, roll your bicycle out to the tra train. Uh, the conductor in this case will take the bike for you and, and, and find storage space in there. Uh, those baggage sec sections are a little smaller they're also handling all the baggage for the customers on the train. So the space is a, at a premium. Uh, we're only uh, able to accommodate two bicycles per train on that route. And those two routes that have that type of service are the Texas Eagle between Chicago and Texas uh, and the city of New Orleans between Chicago and New Orleans. Unfortunately, there are some of our longer distance trains that do not have baggage service at all. They don't have a baggage car. Uh, and nor do they have the Amfleet two style cars that have the bike that have the bike towers in them where you can put your bike rack. So we're not able to accommodate bicycles at all on trains like the Maple Leaf between New York City and Niagara Falls or the Adirondack uh, up to the border at Plattsburgh uh, or the Lakeshore Limited between Boston, the Lakeshore Limited section that peels off at Albany over to Boston. Um, no bicycles are able to be accommodated, but on most of these routes, there are other trains that you can, uh, or alternate routes that you can employ to actually uh, get your bicycle to where you want to go. And I'll uh, pass it on to uh, Mariah at that point to talk about some of the changes uh, that we've made in the booking channel so that you can easier, you can, it'll be easier for you to find space for yourself and your bike on the train. Um, thank you, Derek. Uh, I noticed a lot of questions, and I think some of the questions hopefully will be, um, a, things will be a little clearer when you get a chance to see how the, the what we call the booking channel works on Amtrak.com. Uh, and then right before this, I double checked, and it looks like we have the very similar resources available on our app too. So if you have the Amtrak app on your phone, um, personally, I think a lot of the time, I, it's a little easier for me to use that. So. Um, these these two elements of our web resources do mirror each other, uh, which I, I think is great for a lot of, of folks like you that want to get on and off the train and figure out which ones you can actually bring your bike on. So if you go to Amtrak.com, uh, at the very top of our landing page, you'll see a spot where you can put in, I want to go from here to there. Uh, and in this case, um, did a screenshot of um, looking at going from <laughs> Chicago to uh what is crv derek C cantonville crv is carlinville illinois carlinville that's right springfield and alton that's oh, right so we picked this one because if you were to open up another window right now i'm terrible at zoom so i'm just gonna 
be illustrative here. If you opened up another window right now and you went to Amtrak.com and you put in Chicago to Carlinville, um, you would see a bunch of trains come up. If you then look at the feature on your screen, it's, it's both on um, the website piece or even on your phone, you can see something that says sort and filter. And if you click that and scroll down, you'll see a picture of a bike. And many of you might remember that. We used to have a bike feature in another variation of our website. And I think that has always been really helpful when people can just see the image. So if you click that, push the word bike and then push done, it will filter all the trains that are going between your city pairs that you want to visit that have bike service. So um, when I did that, I did the Chicago to Carlinville and it, it annulled a couple of trains or took them off, not annulled them, but it, it took them off my view. And, um, and it gave me these two trains. So these both have bike service, the River Runner and the Lincoln service. Um, and then from there you can pick, I want to take a coach trip. And then because this is not a live, this is a screenshot. Uh, if you click on that, you'll see there's bike service and you can pay for your bike service. So I think that is a, a little bit more helpful than um, uh, it was before. Cause I think it was quite hard, honestly, for anyone to figure out you had to go all the way through the booking channel, put in your credit card, and then, <laughs> and then hopefully be asked if you want to take a bike. So th this, um, we hope will make things a lot clearer. Um, and um, so I, I don't, so I think we're going to take questions at the end, but I, I wanted to make sure I flagged that for all of you. And like I said, this works both on the website uh, or on your uh, cell phone, which um, I think is kind of great. So, um, and this is all again, you get to it through Amtrak.com. Um, can I move the slide forward or is that somebody else? We got a lot of comments that said thank you, and that's much better and very helpful. Oh, that's great! That's great to hear. And actually, I think someone from our um, the, that that part of our team that's been helping Derek and I figure out what what we could do that would be most helpful right now. Uh, I think he might have just joined, so I I think that would be great for him to hear. Um, can I make the slide go to the next one? I'm nothing I'm doing is making that happen. All right. Um, thank you. So another place that is on our website um, is a, a bike FAQ site. It's at amtrak.com backslash bike.fax. We, me and Derek, who just had a, a meeting last week, Derek and I had a meeting about this last week. Um, there's still relevant information on here, but honestly, it's pretty confusing. So he and I are in the process of auditing what's on here. And then trying to, we did these drop down things because I think when we first set this site up, it, that's like kind of what everybody was doing. But now it it really, I think, adds more confusion than clarity. So we're trying to figure out how to reformat this a little bit so that it's a lot clearer for folks. Um, and this is a place where, you know, if you have 15 minutes that you want to like take a look at what's already online and say, these pieces, if you could make this a little better, would be really helpful. Um, feel free to share that with us because we're in the middle of trying to um, audit all these pages and then make them make more sense. And I think we're going to move away from these drop down things because unfortunately, I, I don't think it tells you what you need to know when you're a biker, which is I'm getting to the train and now what? You know, I booked my ticket and now what's going to happen? So, um, we're going to try and probably rethink how we project that information. So um, I, and I think what was that the last slide? Oh yeah. There's Derek and I on our way on a bike trip. Uh, we have been around the country a lot on our bikes. <laughs> uh, and so I think we share some of your um, aspirations for how we can make this better for us uh, on a personal level. And then for the community we serve, um, I mean, another thing that I, has been really on my mind is um, bike share. I think it's really complicated to get in and out of bike share systems and all the services that we touch. So I'd like to see a way of making that clearer because when I go to New York on the train, I'd love to be able to jump on, you know, I actually have lifts, so I think I can use it there. But it's just making the awareness of people uh, when they get on our trains. If you don't bring your bike, there are lots of ways to move around. Um, by bike or by scooter or by other means when you get to the station. And I, I'd like that to be clearer for our riders too in the future. So um, I think this is 
a pretty good overview of where we are today. Um, honestly, we have a pretty robust level of service uh, that we can offer, I think, for the summer uh, and into the fall. We One of the challenges we had during COVID, a lot of the um, baggage cars were pulled out of service. So many of those, we really worked hard with our crews to get them back in service. So as much equipment as is available uh, to us right now is running around the country delivering humans and bags and dogs and all sorts of things. So um, the more equipment we get through the um, our facilities, the, the more service we can offer in more places. We're really excited that the state equipment in the Midwest is rolling out. That's that venture equipment that Derek showed a picture of that will give us a lot more service on the services that are served by those in, um, in, in and out of the Midwest. So that's really exciting. And then underway is um, the replacement of, you saw a picture during our slide presentation of the equipment we called the Amfleet Ones. Um, that equipment and then a number of other types of equipment that are running in, let's say the Pacific Northwest, um, Pennsylvania, New York, North Carolina, those trains will see, or those services will see new equipment uh, on the horizon in the next several years. So uh, it's currently being built um, out in California, but we're, we're kind of a long ways from getting those in service um, today. We, we have a few years until we'll see them entering revenue service. But in the meantime, we wanna make sure that every piece of equipment we currently own does the most it can for all the people riding the trains, including bikers. So. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you had any other um, agenda items for this part, Karen, or should we take some questions? Or I, you, you told me, and then I promptly forgot what we're doing today. That's okay. <laughs> I'll um, moderate the question. I've been watching the chat box, <laughs> so I'll, I'll start asking you some questions. Uh, quick one. We got one. What about boxing bikes? Where are their instructions for how to do that? Uh, well, I think that the uh, there are a couple of places you find information about box bikes. It, it, essentially, the rule is, and Derek, you're a little more of an expert than I, but anywhere we have checked bats, that means where there are people working at the station uh, that can take the the box and then bring it over to the train and put it on the train for you. That those are the places where we can provide the the box service. And uh, I think for some of the things we've heard from the bike community. The, that can be really helpful if, for instance, you have a, a special bike that you want to make sure is protected while it's in uh, transit. Um, it's also, I think, helpful for people that are going from one uh, service to another. Sometimes it's easier for those connections when the box has to get moved to another train. Uh, occasionally, I think it gets a little confusing for folks if they're bike is on the train and then they got to grab it and then go to their next connection and bring the train over. So some folks have found boxing bikes helpful. Um, um, and so that that is available at any station that has staffing today. And that staffing, again, tends to be at major stations where we can justify the expense of having employees. So I know we serve a lot of smaller communities that uh, may not, will, won't have ticket agents, but it's primarily major cities like your Cleveland's, Toledo's, Memphis is uh, even Fargo, North Dakota. So all okay. of those uh, ticket agents uh, where there is check baggage service will have bike boxes available for sale. Uh, the bike box, there is a charge for the bike box. I can't remember if it was $10 or $15, uh, plus a small charge for shipping the bike. But as Mariah said, if you're going uh, through a place where you have to change trains, it may be easier for you to just check the check the bicycle and we'll move the bicycle from one train to the other uh, without you having to take it off, hold onto your bike until your next train and then take it back to the next train and hand it up if you're using one of our train side check bicycle services or a carry on service. So okay. the box bikes are still available. So if you're on the website and you're looking through the sort, and it has, and you see the bike, then there may be roll-on service. But if you don't see that, but it is a staff station, then you need to box your bike. Is that a yes. fair summary? Okay. It is. It is not. It is not likely 
that there will be check baggage service, but not train side check bicycle service. Okay. If there, you know, you can do the sort of the universe of one or the other. If there's going to be check by check baggage for just regular customers, you can check your bike. Uh, and it is very likely, unless it's one of these uh, trains that I've that we indicate. Well, uh, it's very likely then that uh, you can also do train side check bicycle service too. Okay, great. I think that cleared up the question. Um, we got a question about ramps, and if there's ramps available to roll your bike on um, in case the train and the station aren't level, or to get it into the cars. We don't have anything like that yeah, um, yeah. right now. The <clears throat> yeah, we don't have that. Okay. Um, a quick question about how far in advance do you recommend people book their their trip if they want to take a bike? I would say as far in advance as you can, since space is limited, and especially if it's during the summer travel season or if you're going to a location uh, that's high demand. Uh, for for uh, for me here in the Midwest, uh, Herman, Missouri, Jefferson City, and Sedalia are along the Katy Trail. Especially on the weekends in the summer and the fall, those bike spaces go fast. So I would say, uh, err on the side of a month or more. Okay. And, that, and I think Good that morning. one one distinction to make there, and Derek, again, you can always correct me if I'm wrong because I'm I'm a northeasterner these days. Um, on the services where it's more like uh, it's less the journey trains, you can actually I think book a little closer in and probably get most of the time you can get a spot like if i'm going from dc to new york and i want to go later this week i can probably find a train where i can you know with the um with the roll on service i can i can probably find a spot it's particularly true if we have limited frequencies of trains going to a particular city so if you have one train a day on the long distance trains and there's only you know so much capacity on the capital limited to get you to harper's ferry or something make sure that you try and book as soon as you possibly can. But for places like, you know, California corridor or something, you can, or the surf liner, you know, you can just kind of show up um, sometimes, or at least like just, you know, check the app before you're about to leave and make sure there's space for your bike. Um, I think level of service and frequency of service really matter, but a lot of the routes your folks, I think care about for big journeys on bikes, you should book a little far out, especially if you want a room too, because we're very limited on sleeping accommodations on trains. Okay. Yeah, thanks for some... that clarification. You're right on. Okay. I got some questions on different types of bikes. So recumbent bikes. Yeah, we're at, we're still not able to accommodate recumbent bikes. Um, you can do them boxed on the services that have uh, bag cars, um, as long as they fit in a bike box. And I know some people have broken their recumbent bikes into like two boxes and put them on before. So that is the way we're able to move recumbent bikes. Okay. Uh, folding bikes. So folding bikes, as long as they are, there's a standard size, which I think you and I looked, Derek is, is on the website of like, here's a, what a folding bike dimension is. Um, if it basically can become a luggage, a piece of your luggage, uh, that is you totally just carry fair. carry it on anywhere. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about e-bikes? Yeah, I think we can carry e-bikes. I think the challenge is some of the e-bikes get quite large, especially their tires. You have to be able to fit them in that hook. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I think we have a weight, um, guide on our, on some of our hooks. So um, I, honestly, I, th I think they probably size out before they wait out at, at this point, like the tire's just too big or the whole, you know, like I, people in my neighborhood, some of them have the cargo bikes and that sort of thing. Those are just like, you've seen the space. It, it's just, it's sort of standard bike sized. So, okay. um, but e-bikes in general on principle, you can bring on the train. Yeah. Okay. And also so, be cognizant too that we we expect you to be able to handle your bicycle. And so when you're starting to deal with weight issues and trying to move bicycles upstairs or hand them up four feet into the air to a conductor, uh, we expect you to be able to manage that. 
Okay, and then we had trailers. Lots of times people will have their bike and then have the trailer where maybe they have kids or stuff, their luggage. What's the rule on bringing bike trailers? I mean, I think the challenge we have with trailers is if there's a bag car, there, there might be a world where there's space for those, but we don't have any way to tie them down. So your stuff, it like even when you sort of conceive of it, it would just sort of be flying around, like not the luggage goes flying around, but it's like, it's going to be just sort of sitting in there. Um, when people bring their uh, bikes with their pannier bags, I never say it right. Pannier bikes. Yeah. Oh, pannier. Okay. Uh, they usually take them off and you can kind of settle them in next to your bike. Um, in Inside, anywhere that we have roll-on service, like in, unless there's a world where one of those kind of folds down into something that looks like a foldable bike, like there's just got to be a place for it. And, and when you're in service, when you're on the coach where the people are walking around, it's got to be able to be, you know, and I don't know enough about what's out there, but if there are um, trailers that really fold down into something that looks like the size of a piece of luggage, you could probably just carry it on. If, if it's like a trailer, like, you know, you, you, I think most of us have been on the train. There's really just nowhere for that to be. Yeah, to, it's, you, you'll need to uh, consolidate your your carry-ons into veneer bags. I mean, that's what I do. I have four. Uh, and so I just throw them over my shoulder and bring them on as carry-ons. And then the bike uh, goes in the bike space, depending on what the train service is. Okay. And then uh, we're almost at time for Q&A, but I wanted to ask one more which is when we as consumers go to Amtrak, everything, you know, it's, there's one way to book a ticket regardless of where you're going. But yet what you're telling us is there's all different kinds of services on different lines. And then when we go to stations, sometimes different stations have different, different accessibility. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Sure. Sure. Um, it's a history of the railroad class, uh, I think, a little bit. Um, I mean, honestly, since Amtrak was created uh, in 1971, we have we have really provided service over um, either collaborative tracks where we share railroad um, infrastructure with our host partners. Uh, so many of the places that are outside the Northeast, um, those tracks are owned by class one railroads by and large, some short lines. And when you when your train is traveling down the tracks, it's passing by and served served by stations that are owned by sometimes a city, sometimes a host railroad, sometimes a private entity, sometimes us. It's it's a kind of hodgepodge. Um, so from tracks to stations, there's a lot of variability. There's over 500 stations in our network uh, and all of them are Oh, you know, by and large, uh, part of the the origins of of the country's you know railroad transportation network through the 1800s. So, like 1800s, 1900s into the you know 2000s, things have have grown. We've developed service in different ways across our network and new stations, and maybe took what were once flag stops and put a platform there, but really prior to stuff that we've done in very recent history, a lot of this is legacy that we're traveling over and where people are waiting for our service to show up at. Uh, the other piece is we also inherited kind of a hodgepodge of equipment from uh, the class ones when we first started out um, as a company. And over the years through fits and starts, we've been able to provide new equipment uh, but it's usually been pretty slow in coming. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see in the Northeast is decades old. Uh, and some of the stuff that you see operating on long distance trains is older. Um, and so uh, one of the things we're really excited about in the new infrastructure bill is we're we're basically going to be able to refleet most of what still hasn't been replaced over the last, let's say, 10 years. You know, a lot of states have bought new equipment. But we're going to be able to replace a lot of the other equipment that runs around the country. We're doing our best to make much of that equipment as similar uh, as it can be uh, in, in the various places that we serve uh, to the degree that Amtrak controls that. Again, states pay for some equipment and some have already invested in um, 
rolling stock that will be different from the new equipment uh, that we're already you know, purchasing. I mentioned the new aero trains out in California. And then we're also looking at long distance equipment and that's the that's really the the equipment that serves a lot of these journey trains that folks are excited about the California Zephyr, the Co Co Starlight, the um, um, the Builder, uh, Empire Builder. So fleets like that, you you try as a company now that we have some resources to actually kind of get ahead of some of the need for replacing equipment. You try to make as much of it as similar as it can be to the equipment pool that you're you're offering. Um, it, it, that makes a lot of sense. But that just because you can make the equipment similar doesn't mean you've been able to change all the stations or the tracks or the uh, the platforms. That is, as I said, it's over 500 stops. So there's just a lot of inherent variability in the US system. Um, other countries really prioritize passengers and then freight is part of their network, uh, kind of um, with, with less of a focus. We really focus on moving freight in this country on our tracks. So the freight railroads really get to determine a lot of what happens on the tracks that we share with them to deliver intercity service. So all of that, I think, goes um, into the sort of recipe of what makes it never dull, trying to figure out how to deliver everything from bike service to really accessibility is a big part of what we're focused on this year. We're spending over a billion dollars to try and make um, our trains as accessible as they can be at like more than 200 stations that we actually have pretty good control over. So um, I, I, that's sort of a lot about legacy, but I think then a lot about the thoughtfulness that we try to approach our planning for the future where we can control the various inputs, uh, trying to make it better for folks like bike uh, riders and and people in wheelchairs and, you know, mothers with, um, I always call them prams because I suddenly become British, but uh, <laughs> baby carriages, you know, all these different kinds of users that come onto our trains. So they're really sort of um, sometimes hemmed in by either the equipment that we have, the current infrastructure that we operate over or the stations themselves. So Derek, did I miss anything? I think you covered that really well. Uh, I was just a couple of weeks ago, I was at a station uh, in Michigan uh, that has been in service since 1879. And we put up a plaque there because the station just prior to it was a key spot on the Underground Railroad. Uh, but an 1879 train station, uh, that's, that's still in service. Uh, and so, you know, there are challenges inherent uh, with adapting that to modern needs because uh, we've got historic preservation laws that we need to abide by. I think, though, where we can do, do where we can make uh, progress is on the level of signage uh, that we can provide to our customers ahead of time so they know uh, where they're supposed to go uh, in terms of our communications to folks ahead of time. Uh, to help them understand this is the process with this with the style of ticket that I've purchased, uh, we can always do better in, at that as well. All right, I thank you. I wanted to ask that because I think that's one of the things that I've learned being part of the task force, and I think that creates both um, opportunities opportunities and challenges from the advocacy front. But wanted to let folks know that moving forward. So I wanted to say uh, thanks to Derek and Mariah, and I'm gonna ask folks to stay on for one more minute because I wanted to share um, a couple of things that we're also looking forward to as the task force. And as I said at the beginning, we didn't have time for all the questions. We will save the chat. We will have those questions. We'll see what, um, we can do about getting answers, but we also wanted to share this survey with you. Patty's gonna put a link in the, um, in the chat so you can get in there and ask more questions or give us any feedback. I wanted to talk about this. We wanted to do this for two reasons. Lots of times we as bike organizations get all this feedback, but we wanted to have it in one place and organized so it's easier for us to look at it, for Amtrak to look at it, and to see what those trends are. A couple of things about the survey, that first red arrow, this is not for immediate help. So if you are at an Amtrak station um, or you're like 
on your way to the station to book uh, to to get on a trip, this is not the place to ask a question or make changes. But um, if you've just maybe got off of a a trap uh, a trip and you want to give changes, or maybe you've been thinking about something and you want to ask, I know like some of the questions that we haven't been able to ask yet. That's what this is for. So there's two options. When you look at the second arrow, one is if you just recently took your, your bike on Amtrak and maybe you had a really great experience and you wanna share that. Uh, maybe you had trouble with the uh, luggage tower and you wanna share that. Whatever it is, experiences good or bad, help us know, um, you know what to think about in terms of priorities, what to share like, hey, this is really working. We wanna see more of that. Or if like some of the questions we had here about, you know, I'd really love for you to be able to take recumbents or um, a ramp might be helpful, you know, something like that, then you can go to that second option to submit uh, general comments. So that's what this survey is. It's going to be ongoing. We're gonna be reporting both to the task force so we can think about, we can, weigh it when we think about what we're gonna be working on. It will also go to Amtrak so that they see it. Um, so yeah, please share, please use that. The other thing, as I said, this is gonna be a series of webinars. So our next webinar is gonna be in July and we're gonna have a couple of bike folks who have used Amtrak and bike to do study tours. So Adriana Atencio is the executive director of Commonweal. That's a bike co-op in Lancaster, PA. And she got a grant to go out and study different bike co-ops. And she chose to do it with a folding bike on Amtrak. So she, uh, it'll be interesting if you're interested in traveling on Amtrak with a folding bike, or if you're just interested in bike co-ops. And then Connor Herbert is a federal policy fellow here with the league who actually decided he wanted to get involved in bike advocacy because he was doing a study tour um, in different cities. So he and his colleague were using Amtrak to get to the different cities and then bike share within cities. And that made him think, you know, there's ways that we could maybe do this, do this piece easier, whether that's bike share or Amtrak. So I hope you'll join us for that. You can also use the survey to say, hey, I'd love for you to do a webinar on something else or this or that, you know. So we really hope we'll use that. We absolutely want this uh, task force to be a conversation. I'm gonna ask that folks really use the survey instead of reaching out to any one task force member individually, because we wanna make sure that everyone on the task force um, can get the information. So with that, I wanna say thank you again to Mariah and Derek um, and all the to adventure cycling for all their work up to this point, leading the Amtrak Bike Task Force, and to all those individual members of the task force who've really helped push things forward. Uh, we look forward to talking to you in July and to uh, hearing your ideas and your questions. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone.